Yeah, so to my talk, as the title suggests, I'm going to speak about how the practice of reading has been taken up by some more or less recent contemporary art. Um, central, I think, is going to be uh, the way reading is used to compose certain exercises around identity, but also attempts to withdraw from the ways in which identity has been instrumentalized, especially since diversity has become a kind of corporate court word to uphold the structures maintaining inequality and divide the workforce. Um, but not to get sucked into that too much into the political economy, but get to the talk. Um, so I, I want to talk about three cases or something like that. Um, each is roughly 10 minutes. And um, I'll start with, I, I was asked to uh, talk about Henrik Olsson since he was in Madrid last year uh, with, with a huge, really impressive uh, retrospective. And then I'll talk about um, Lisa Skolnes' body of work, which I think is a, kind of a really interesting response to all this, and it's more conceptual painting, but uh, I think it's it's offers some ways to maybe develop some of the dead ends of Olsen. And then I'll end on a discussion of just one single work um, by Jane Q, um, recent installation, Bad Driver, that is currently on view in uh, at the Kunstwerke in Berlin. Uh, in Berlin. Um, yeah. And in the background of these three juxtapositions have us maybe something like a story or something, a story about whether withdrawal itself might... Oh, can you hear me? Yeah? Sorry, I just heard something. Oh, okay, I'm just going to continue. A uh, story about whether withdrawal um, itself might be a dead-end road, whether it functions to absolve the staging of a conflict um, and we better withdraw, whether we better withdraw from withdrawing before it's too late. So I'm going to start with Henrik. Um, so, um, so when Henrik Olsson's lack of information in 2001 opened at the Kunstverein Braunschweig, reforming institutions was still, or again, important to uh, artistic practices in Germany. Um, in conversation with that trend, Olsson's site-specific site intervention marked forms of exclusion, dividing the space into two differently sized rooms. He left the front room completely empty, exposing the white neutrality of the walls. The smaller back room connected by a scaled down door consisted of a grid of over 200 web images uh, printed on photo paper, which you can see here. Um, co okay, corresponding to an idiosyncratic logic around a hundred of Somehow I can hear myself now. Um, sorry, something changed. Uh, sorry. Did you change something in the setup? Um, okay. Okay, maybe I'm just going to take out the... Uh, oh, now it works again. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, corresponding to an idiosyncratic logic around 100 of uh, the images were subtitled with different texts, which you can see here in the image, um, each characterizing various national sodomy laws. Um, the invitation card for the exhibition, which is reprinted in the accompanying catalog, excerpted a study analyzing the highest suicide rate among young homosexuals in the 1990s. Um, one of the causes namely, and I quote, lack of information, unquote, uh, unevenly underlined with the black marker, makes clear that raising awareness is an ambition the artist does not fully withdraw from, or he retains. So, um, and I think one of the crucial points about that exhibition, and why it became important for so many people, was that debunking the neutrality of the white cube was now about inducing the structural oppression of homosexuality into the frame. Um, as often as this crucial expansion has been noted, something else has been strangely obscur obscured in Olison's practice that I think is retrospective last year at the Rhino Sophia, curated by Helena Tatai, rendered apparent. Um, the inner dispute, result of a crisis and symptomatic of an unresolved tension for um, standing in between, possibly something like a queer attitude comes closest to what I mean, even if it's like a bit rusty, maybe as a formulation. And um, 
we're gonna get to some doors here also and windows i mean so maybe what lydia was just describing is uh, very related in some way um um, so lack of information is emblematic of Olson's early practice because it's a delicate balancing act between political didacticism, I think, which you can see in a way in this image, and formal withdrawal between the social analyst and the art fan, between informing and excluding. Mm. Uh, and as much as the gestures remain relatively stable of Olson, I think over like two decades of his practice, that balancing of that tension changes quite drastically and um, moves into a certain direction. A possible starting point to talk about this shift is this work. Um, Some faggot gestures this is part of uh, a book that came out in 2008. Um, so where he used black panels and vitrines as backdrop um, and assembled historical material depicting various phenomena surrounding homosexuality, such as dandyism, sadomasochistic castigation, and female communes. Uh, and in certain proximity, not just to Abi Warburg's Minimusuna Atlas, um, as it is often noted, but also to 1970s feminists, such as Ulrike Rosenbach. Olison composes identity through the history of representation. The accompanying somewhat academic essay he wrote pre-post speaking backwards picks up where the panels end, namely around 1870 when according to Foucault the term homosexuality was first adopted. And in this essay artists like John Cage and Alain Raven are narrated as part of a struggle against the heteronormative environments. Warburg's idiosyncratic taxonomies uh, uh, were thus somewhat punctuated by uh, uh, Olson punctuated the, this kind of formalist uh, um, texture of art history in a certain way, introducing like social struggles into them. And he gave a simple reason for shifting the tension away from juridical political immediacy towards this more art historical one um, in an interview published a couple of years ago. And I quote from the interview here. Um, I wanted to focus on a more positive aspect of sexuality and cultural patterns. I was interested in homosexual artists and subcultures as such, and less concerned about the structures that have criminalized and repressed them, unquote. So the ambivalence of the historical struggle, the punctuation of formalism was a tool to evade the danger of victimization in a certain way. So where to go from here, right? Where to go? So it would be wrong to think to simply think of formalism as Olison's enemy, though. I think formal precision and reduction, and you probably will have seen that at the um, retrospective in Madrid, uh, were very much part of his practice from the very beginning. But in the usually, at least in the early work, this reduction is usually countered by an elegant dirtiness, a desire for content. I think a great work to think about this is on the left, uh, is um, social, uh, yeah, um, social organization and frequency of homosexual behavior among giraffes from 2000. A milk carton onto which he collaged text detailing homosexuality among giraffes. Um, so I think this is a really crucial work. And if you compare these two, so there's like 20, 20 years in between them. Um, and if you do that, um, the recent works of Olsen expose something like the risk of ever increasing pressure on form and self-reference, possibly concluding the delicate balancing of his early work. I think in his last exhibition at Galli Buchholz in New York offers a glimpse. Um, instead of appealing to the didactic flatness of the Warburgian panel, Olsen made that same thought imagery disappear halfway, you can see it here, right? Uh, yeah, so think about the Faggy Gestures, um, some Faggy Gestures exhibition and book, and now this. Um, I also made the same thought image as the halfway by interiorizing them in a series of box, boxes titled Festival of the Unconscious, it's 2019. Um, similarly, the previously inscribed milk cartons, and I'm going back now here, um, were now replaced by the monochromatic sculpture Milk, product of filling milk cartons with epoxy resin. You know, it's, rather than being exposed to an unresolved dispute between content and container, 
you know, literally facing an entirely opaque and self-referential interiority. As, and I think there's something, something symptomatic here happening. Um, as one of the most crucial voices for what art after might be, art after um, whatever kind of thing, Olson's recent practice that begs the question at what point does the investigation of exclusion turn itself into an exclusive rehearsal? And what to do when the door is not just scaled down, but simply closed? Um, so, yeah, and I think that that is basically the way where I would position the second body of work, which um, is Lisa Scolny's um, body of work, whose conceptual painting resonates in my eyes very well with the seeming dead end, I think, we're faced with with Olsen and uh, so this is uh, one of her mid-career paintings I'd say early career um, so what do we see here a microphone to water bottle and what appears to be a squinting Michel Houbeck thinking or speaking of both um, made with a paint roller Lisa Skolnis uh, Michel Houbeck ascending in the horizon in 2006 is based on a conference photo cropped in the shape of a downward facing triangle and painted a gradient background that evinces hope or apocalypse or cliche. That same year, um, 2006, uh, saw the release of the English translation of uh, Possibilité d'une île, uh, the possibility of an island, um, in which the libertine French moralist kind of reiterated his quest to withdraw into transcendence, this kind of remote island in heaven until he and his two clones, uh, his novelist uh, protagonist, realize that they're stuck somewhere on the way. So what is, what is withdrawal? Um, and I quote here, um, if I withdraw, I withdraw myself. From what? From the race for city council, from active cocaine dependency, from the relationship, from the chill night air, to withdraw is to vacate what has held, held or kept you and implies movement away from that engagement. Um, Brian Blanch- Blanchfield writes in a quite impressive and uh, uh, I very much recommend that essay collection. It's called Proxies um, 2016, which is a book in which he attempts to retreat entirely from academic research and the information economy and write a book solely based on himself, whatever that might mean. Um, so. Withdrawal is not just a matter of time and space, but it's about emptying something that was filled by moving away from it. Only like that's to get back to the painting with Hubeck's squinting gaze, facing two angles simultaneously, which direction to take, forward or backward, left or right, up or downstream. So Solon's paintings offer some hints at how this withdrawal might take place and how it may, might also change in direction or in vector. So this is another painting. This is a very early painting of hers. Um, in Bikini Girl 1, 2000, uh, painted just after a solo exhibition in the project room of Artist Space in 1999, and having completed her BFA at Emily Carr University of Art and Design, she copied the found image from a bathing suit catalog accidentally sent to her. By smearing a slightly larger canvas onto the fresh fresh pigments of the painted copy, she literally created a mirror image, emptying the meaning by way of allegorical deconstruction in a way. So after leaving Vancouver and gaining distance to photo conceptuals like Stan Douglas, Jeff Wall, and Ian Wallace, um, who at the time in the late 1990s, all at the height of their Canadian careers, so Scully also turned away from allergizing movies and advertisement. Mm. But what to withdraw from and not from the signifier? Um, in which direction to look if not towards mass media? And let's see, I included this. Ah, oh, too bad. Okay. I, the work I'm not going to talk about, I've, it's not in the presentation, but um, it's, the work is called The Work from 2005. It's a painting. And we see a freshly... F- you just have to imagine it now because I made a mistake in the presentation. But um, so we, uh, we see a freshly fractured eggshell next to a chick that has just emerged into a whole new world. Using an image from a clinical psychology book that describes the pathology 
of overproduction. The painting is a homage to Martin Kipberger's inflationary act paintings. But this, what the painting also depicts is this promising new world is not as promising as the chick imagined. Chained to a cannonball, surrounded by an immense blue, its melancholic gaze faces sideways, missing the cozy protection of the act, wanting to retreat to a world that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I guess I'm probably not the only one not expecting this reference um, to Martin Kipmer from a feminist. I mean, he's just calling as a feminist, known as the co-founder of and co-organizer of WAGE, um, which stands for Working Artists and the Great Economy, and really important, I think, certificate for equal remuneration of artists. So, in fact, the infamous German neo-expressionists who were introduced to New York in 1980 as the boys in the Bunde, namely Kippenberger, Albert Irwin, and Georg Herod, became a really important point of tension for Suskoni in the early 2000s, ultimately culminating in her quite ambiguous love letters, uh, Dear Mr. Earl, which is, you can see on the right side, um, it's like a series of paintings. This tension is highlighted in her paintings by deliberately staging some of the key strategies. Um, paint rollers, palette knives, thick gesso tape, and typographic masking are applied to rehearse how the boys played freely with style and techniques. This proximity, what artist Soren Pamela and Lee once described as this group's, and I quote, inverted conceptualism, unquote, which means the reduction of, uh, the, the replacement of, like basically replacing where, where reduction, uh, where conceptual art was earlier about reduction, it's now replaced with excess. That's basically her idea of inverting conceptualism. Um, and that's kind of, I think, emphasized by Sus Colony. Uh, you can see it on the, on the left side, a feminist issue is um, um, with like ironic slogans, uh, either in the title or directly inscribed onto the canvas. Um, which is uh, a feminist issue is, and it's, uh, yeah. Um, so, but it also becomes clear that these semi-homages are driven by the question of how artistic value is constituted, how the boys manage to substitute style for attitude and turn experience into an exchange value. So if these earlier paintings tell a story of how this is going to change directions from deconstruction to ironic excess and from mass media to symbolic value, the more recent work exhibits one cohesive body of paintings. So uh, this, this is one of them. Um, named after Bethany Frankel, the incarnation of oblivious privilege as staged in a lead role in the TV show, The Real Housewives of New York City. Um, Bethany, I mean, that's what the um, painting series is called. Some of the most ambitious projects Siskoin has worked on, it's, it was developed between 2011 and 2016, so five, roughly five years. Um, at the center of the 13 identically titled paintings is a black void surrounded by an always smiling, sometimes sleepy crescent and various types of often childishly painted decorative elements such as flowers, grids, or meanders. At times, this decorative that this decoration is accompanied by ready-made signs such as tilted Christian cross or yin and yang or a factory uh, the moon appears to dream of, which could be understood as a kind of lab like reference to our own la labor activism. Um, so having left behind the deconstruction of mass media imagery, liberated from external references and author authoritative um, sources, that kind of, one of some of the art fan work she did exhibit it. The new, I think, really idiosyncratic and enigmatic paintings that you can see here with Bethany, I think, takes one step further in the analysis of artistic value. This kind of, how should I say, transmutation, you should say, of stones into gold, in a way. So not with bitter irony, but with a strange form of sincere humor, Bethany depicts the production process of cohesion, style, and interiority as a production process. Um, so it, even if, and it's, maybe it's a bit of a mm, sentence I'm not going to read, it's a bit heavy, but even if facing the backyard in the middle of the night, Suscolny manages to paint, paint windows again. So I think there's, there's some kind of difference to all of a sudden here, very strong difference. Okay, and now the last one, 
uh, which is moving into a slightly different direction, I think. And it's also the most recent one. Uh, it's this show that was shown earlier this year at Essex Street Gallery and is currently on view in Berlin. Um, and I think that Bad Driver, it's called, is an attempt to understand where power might reside in learning environments and where the enemy lies, so the same. Um, so if Bad Driver's installation is trying to mimic a driver's education class, as the title seems to suggest, it must be one reserved for corporate clients. In fact, the 12 prom chairs neatly composed into a grid are more likely to be encountered in a fancy conference setting than at the DMV. The type of chair exhibited is famous for its stackability, um, being able to put up to 40 on top of each other, so it's really quite practical, thus making it a favorite for con convention centers. Um, a black book lies on the small, um, on this on this small attached table, which the visitor may read through. Though it's the same book on each table, the cover is different on each one. Reading the title of the work, "Bad Driver," and underneath, and I'm going to show you here. I think, uh, oh, no, this one. No, wait, oh, it's missing. Sorry. Okay, it's missing. Um, it's the chapter title. Um, the number of chairs correspond here to the amount of chapters of the book, which is uh, produced for the occasion of the exhibition. And I think the word produce is important here because it's not really written. Um, it's crucial to highlight that the artist who didn't write this book themselves, but hired a research assistant, Akiti Chiu, who conducted both the research and the writing with the artists operating as hands-off editors. This subcontracting might remind one of the proto or post-conceptual gestures for artists like Marcel Duchamp or Martin Kippenberger, who both employed sign painters. And you can see it um, here. This is, this is one of the paintings, a uh, famous painting series, um, where in the early 80s, uh, Kippenberger employed like a sign painter and the sign, like, he would say what he should, that person should paint and then um, pay him. Um, and this, I mean, in this earlier configuration, both with Duchamp and with Kippenberger, it's, the idea was to rebuke the equation between art and self-expression, um, uh, more specifically maybe between painting and self-expression. But I think in contrast to their predecessors, Jane Q's subcontracting is not about hollowing the medium of painting. It's not really, uh, yeah. Rather, the subcontracting attempts to articulate a problem in the way in which art and research are being entangled with the latter often functioning to validate and legitimize the former. Um, oh yeah, this is, this is how the book looks. So this becomes clear as when one enters the space between the covers. The book's 12 chapters cover vast ground, collaging materials from 4,000 years of Asian history. As the preface makes clear, this collaging is not supposed to enlighten the visitor or educate them. And I quote here from the uh, introduction, Taken as a whole, the essays in Bad Driver present a portrait of, uh, square quotes, Asians that rely on the reader's presumptions and internalized prejudices far more than the material cited within. Like a mirror, the work reflects back to the reader what they already know in, the, in, um, know in their of hearts to be true, unquote. So this is basically the ambition of, of this exhibition, uh, which is... It's supposed to mirror and reinforce one's own prejudices. In case in Ponyas chapter nine names, uh, yeah, yeah, which you can see here, ranging from Marco Polo's notes on prostitution in China to first century uh, sex handbooks on giving women an orgasm, Taoist techniques on ejaculation and yin and yang, the chapter assembles this material to create an image of sexually inept Asian men and arcanely erotic Asian women. The crux here is the method. Like so much other research-based art, Bad Driver borrows heavily from academic scholarship. And taken on their own, none of the sentences written in the book are untrue or an outright lie. But the collage, the way that collage collaged, operates so that it transfigures truth into these racist stereotypes. And I quote again, mm, given how wide they cast their net, it was nearly impossible not to find information that could corroborate or could be made to corroborate contemporary stereotypes, the preface reiterates. 
Only what is the function of creating something that would mirror and solidify one's own racist prejudices? But driver gives two answers in a way. On the one hand, it seems to be a comment on knowledge production itself, somewhat akin to people like Bruno Latour's theory of science that he elaborated on in so many texts of his. So probably circulatory reference is a very good one in that regard. And um, what these, what this seems to be is about is that a fact is always part of a long chain of references. Uh, it's not, it can't be taken out of this chain simply. Like you can't just quote like, uh, um, yeah, something with, well, by just taking out, it becomes basically untrue. And I quote it again from the, uh, from the preface, the fact's factual quality was dependent on the surrounding details of its original context. Once severed, the fact immediately lost its very similitude as a fact, unquote. And it, that could be almost a quote from Latour, but it's not. It's in, it's in, the, in that book. So. so that seems like the way in which Bad Driver D and recontextualizes facts could thus be understood as a way to point out the dangers of unmooring knowledge, as it often happens when artists use research, research within the white cube. Um, the authority derived from reporting research practices into the exhibition space is in this way exposed by way of ironic exaggeration. On the other hand, the exhibition certainly tries to engage ideas of race and racism in a certain way. And as the book states, and I quote here, redefining ethnic identity as recondite esoteric assemblage is to turn it into a conspiracy theory, secret, conspirational, fun, unquote. In staging a kind of paranoid reading exercise, eclectically combining a vast amount of data only to reinforce whatever one might be thinking all along, the point seems to be hardly new, namely that race is a social construct produced by racism, not the other way around. That's kind of, I would say, in a way, if you get beyond the irony. But let's stay for a second with the learning environments. I'm almost done here, so um, yeah. Um, there's one work that resonates particularly well with Jane Q, um, and I'm thinking here of this work, yeah. Uh, UCLA Bored to Death from 1982 by the artist and longtime union organizer Fred Lonidier. There's certain apparent similarities. A grid, desks attached to chairs, and an overall educational setting in a way. Now, they operate very differently. In contrast to Jane Q's ironic access channeled through this kind of seamless surface, Ronnie Diaz's work is structured around an obvious tension. This is most clearly pronounced in the assembly-like composition of the tables, which seem to function like a kind of well, a proxy or something for the infrastructures of higher education Ronnie Diaz was at the time working in, and it just emerged from. Learning here appears as a form of labor, and the school as a form of factory with its reliance on rules and discipline. Um, this frame is clearly contrasted to the content of the photographs depicting drawings and scribble carved into the tables. And uh, you can see it a bit better here, um, this one now. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the context of the assembly line, the drawings appear like indices of resistance, spontaneous traces of subversion. In a way, UCLA puts pressure in, on learning environments as exploitative and alienating spaces, stratified by tension between domination and subversion. Maybe as a summary, uh, both works are trying to make sense of power, documenting how it circulates and dominates in an educational setting. But whereas Lonidia takes the liberal institution of public higher education as the starting point, Jane Q have a different target. This becomes clear in the sculptured aspects of their work, not so much about driver's education. The modular chromatic chairs reference a corporate setting. Combined with the content of the book, Bad Driver seems to be ironically staging a kind of corporate anti-racism training. However, this is not to explicate a tension between the setting and the subject, between the workplace and the worker, between employer and employee which would ultimately be about inducing distance or estrangement as in the case of Lonidier. Rather, it is about sucking one into the work and the more one is being sucked into it, the more one gets, gets to see oneself, the more racist one is. The point is the enemy 
is not the school or the employer. The enemy is within oneself in a way. And um, yeah, thank you. That that's it. That was that was the end. Um, yeah. It's too bad I can't see anyone. It would be nice to have like a kind of camera of that situation. Yeah.